Well, thank you all for coming, and David, it's a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, there's much to unpack here, so let's take a few minutes uh, for those who are staying to uh, address some of the issues. So uh, let me start by uh, noting that although Hitler was known for the burning of books, the film, I think, adds some dimensions. So tell me your, your reaction, if you would. Um. It's on. It's on. You can hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, it is an extraordinarily powerful film, especially the uh, connections at the end to the great replacement theory. Um, it is not only in Germany that the intellectuals and that the intellectual history is imbued with racism, with hatred. It is very much part of American intellectual history in the same way. Madison Grant was not alone. The Boston Brahmins at the home of Harvard in Cambridge in Boston were the major proponents of what would later morph into the Great Replacement Theory. The Act, Immigration Act of 1924, the Immigration Restriction Act, was pushed hard by Henry Cabot Lodge um, and the Immigration Restriction League. And it ended up in cutting off from safety millions of Eastern European Jews who no longer able to travel to the United States were trapped in what in less than 20 years from 1924 became Nazi conquered land. Uh, ideas have consequences. Words have consequences. Hate speech has consequences. And as the last speaker in the film said, we are all responsible for making those connections clear. It is not enough to say, and it should not be said, that Hitler and his murderous ideologies, his ideas that led to World War II and the murder of the six million um, was an aberration. Uh, in, in, indeed, um, you know, obviously it didn't occur in a vacuum and you mentioned eugenics uh, from places like Columbia and Cold Spring Harbor and universities like Harvard that I attended, uh, no question. Now, I do want to get into the great replacement theory and all in a moment, uh, but any surprises that came to you from the film? For me, I wasn't aware that Hitler never visited concentration camps. Um, there, there was one absence, I think, one connection that could have been made. Um, Magna Teter, extraordinary Jewish histor historian of Jews who was not Jewish, who's now teaching at Fordham, has written a book called Christian Supremacy. What the film refers to is the supernatural. This fear of the demonic comes directly out of Christian theology. The Jew as the other. The Jew as the Christ killer. The Jew as murderous. There is a connection between the occult and the Christian doctrine that labels the Jew as the other who has to be carefully, carefully, carefully watched and guarded so that he and she does not 
destroy Christian civilization. So I, I would have liked to see a little bit more of, of that connection made. It is not simply Catholicism. Um, Magda Teter writes about Christian supremacy. Um, Luther was as venomous an anti-Semite as any number of popes and, and Catholic clerics. And that dimension is, is lost a little bit in here. Interesting. There are a lot of antecedents. Um, so let's touch on, before we get to replacement, you know, there's so many texts, the oldest, most convenient hatred of anti-Semitism. In many ways, anti-Semitism is the canary in the coal mine. Uh, I'm reminded of the poem which is emblazoned in our uh, Illinois Holocaust Museum by Father Niemöller. First they came for the trade unionists, I wasn't one. Then they came for the communists, I wasn't one and didn't speak up. Then they came for the Jews, there was no one left to speak. So touch on that, you know, given the, the rich history intellectually and otherwise of what went on that dates back long before the Third Reich. Well, th there's this... <sighs> How can we put it? This white nationalism, this white supremacist ideology that labels white Christian supremacist ideology, that labels all who are not white Christian as the other, and not only as a passive other who is distasteful to look at, who is distasteful to have anything to do with, but is, is dangerous. Um, and I, I, I think in, the, you know, in, in this country as well, um, one of the things that sort of sent chills up and down my spine was during the book burning when Goering says, we have to, and then there's a, I forget the guy's name, a current German politician, says we have to revive our glorious history, and we have to eliminate those who dare to question that glorious history. The 12 years were an aberration. And we should not allow those 12 years to obliterate a thousand years of German history. Well, my God. I mean, is this not what is happening in Florida today? Is this not what is happening and will help happen elsewhere if we don't do something about it? Is this attempt to... God, to remove slavery, to remove the extermination of the native peoples from our history, the equivalent of the book burning that begins in 1933. The, the only way to understand where we are, I, I speak as a historian, I, I can't help it. The only way to understand where we are is to understand where we have come from. And, and the guy in the baseball cap makes that really clear here. Um, he keeps saying, he keeps saying, we as Germans have to understand our larger history. These 12 years do not stand by themselves as a, with parentheses around them. They're part of a larger German history, and I would argue a larger Euro-American white Christian supremacist ideology. Well, and we see it in so many countries, whether it's the alternative to Germany, the group uh, depicted here in France, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, uh, the whites, you know, supremacists in this country, the Jews will not replace us, from Charlottesville that we see in the film. There's so much to unpack, and I think there are a lot of great warnings for what is going on today. And as you said to me in the green room earlier, words matter. Um, 
So uh, very troubling. You know, one footnote, by the way, to touch on, um, when they, it says that books are a play, prelude to, to killing and to death. And I don't know if you've seen this film, and I recommend it to the audience. I brought it to the 92nd Street Y some years ago. It was called A Voice Among the Silent about James McDonald, who went on to become the first U.S. ambassador to Israel. But he was an unheralded figure in the State Department who spoke, spoke truth to power. I'm mentioning it because in 1935, he goes to meet the new chancellor of Germany, Hitler, and he asks him what his true intentions are. And he says, I'm going to annihilate all the Jews. Two weeks later, McDonald meets in the Oval Office with FDR and tells him all this. So it's not like the prelude with the books. It's not like none of this was known. But it is clearly not a parenthesis. And it's part of a longstanding tradition that sadly continues today. Yeah, um, it, it does. It, and and I, I want to make it clear, as, as I always tried to hit home to my students, there is no such thing as anti-Semitism. There are anti-Semitisms. It takes different forms. It has different languages. It has different words. It has different consequences. Um, but it runs through European history, um, world history, now, that does not mean that anything short of that, that we should prepare for another Shoah in the United States. But it does mean that we have to pay attention to the connections, to the connections between fear of the Jew as the other, as the destructive other, and fear of other people, of other immigrants as destructive of American values, of American culture, of American society. Um, the Niemeyer quote um, should more properly or be said, first they came for the Africans, then they came for the Native Americans, you know, then they came for the Eastern European. Then they came for the Chinese. And all along they came for the Jews. And only a, a cross, you know, after I've heard the word crossbreeding here, I don't even, don't even want to use cross as, adjective, as an adjective. But only some kind of cross peoples alliance, because the others are, are us, and the others are the majority. And only when the others stand up and say, we are not the others, we are the people, you know, are, are we going to get someplace? Well, uh, it is the otherness, and it is, you know, there's a concept in our museum of being an upstander, proactive, positive force for change. And it takes people like that to break through this morass. Let me ask you one last question. We'll open it up to a couple of audience questions still. There is a line in the film uh, where they talk about the pseudo-intellectualism of the Jews, uh, where a, a sort of a false dichotomy is, I think, created, where it's said that f future German will not only be a reader, but will, will be a person of character, too. I'd like you to comment on that. Yeah. Um, I, I picked that up, too. Um, it was a way of saying that That it is not enough simply to be an intellectual, to be a reader. One must also be a person of character, which meant for Goering and Aryan um, that the Aryan can get to the truth of this literature. Those who are not cannot get to the truth of this literature. That character, or in 
the Nazi terms race trumps all else when it comes to understanding the world and the dangers to civilization. Well said. A couple of audience questions. Yes, sir. Hold on. I think we have a microphone coming. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. This movie is enormously impactful. Please give us a sense of the genesis of how it was developed and where you plan on publicizing it, showing it. This film, together with Jonathan Greenblatt's latest book, It Can Happen Here, is unfortunately all too relevant. Would you give us some context? Well, I'll try to answer that. Neither I'm involved in a lot of films, and I was asked by the 92nd, uh, the, the JCC here to help moderate this. We're not involved, David and I, in the film, so I can only speak indirectly to it. My sense is that it is planning to go to a lot of festivals, but in many ways I agree with you. It shouldn't simply go to those who are among the converted but rather the, to people whose views are perhaps antithetical and need to hear this. But beyond that, I don't know if Isaac is here who did the introduction. Uh, I don't know where the film is going, but I agree with you. It needs to get broader resonance along with many other films. Yes. Uh, what struck me is something that was missing in the movie. And this is, on the other hand, they burn the books. On the second hand, but on the other hand, Rosenberg was particularly, uh, meticulously in charge of collecting all the books, all the Jewish books, uh, near, uh, uh, near in the basement uh, in, 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 in Frankfurt. And thousands of thousands of books were collected by, by, by Rosenberg himself, who was a high SS officer. And this was not mentioned at all. So can you talk, talk about it? Yeah, I, 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 I was struck by that as well. I mean, the, uh, the great library of Vilna was looted by the, by the SS, by the Germans, as were many other important Jewish libraries. They were looted for two reasons, so that the Jews would never get their hands on this part of their heritage, their legacy, their history, number one. And number two, so that Rosenberg and his associates could go through this literature and to, f to find the root of the demon, of the evil, of the threat that Judaism represented. Um, it's, an, it, it's an extraordinary story, and, and the story of the Vilna Library and its rescue um, and the history of YIVO is, is just an extraordinary one. YIVO. Yeah, actually last week, or maybe the week before, was a film here that I'm involved in called Resistance They Fought Back, debunking the myth that Jews blithely went to the, like sheep to the slaughter, and it depicts much of what you described. Yes, another question. Um, something that struck me in the movie was the quote by Immanuel Kant, which is someone who I, you know, you learn about it in school because obviously these European thinkers are something that we spend a lot of time being educated about. And what are your thoughts on rethinking the education that you've had through the lens of maybe viewing these people through a more um, genuine lens and what their other philosophies or maybe the philosophies that we learned, uh, what they lead to? That's a great, you know, it's a great, Great question. I studied uh, European intellectual history at Columbia, um, and I studied with uh, Leonard Krieger, who is the author of The German Idea of Freedom. And I have dismissed attempts, wrongly I think, dismissed attempts to contextualize 
the European intellectual history tradition, contextualize it by examining its roots and its ignorance of the rest of the world, its Eurocentric focus. Um, and if I were a younger man with nothing else to do, <laughs> I would go back, commend you for doing it, I would go back and reread my Fichte and my Kant and my Hegel um, and my Rousseau and the Enlightenment figures and to look more carefully um, at this Eurocentric uh, focus and what it left out. I didn't know that Kant quote, um, but it's but it's chilling. Is there another one last audience question? I guess for me, one of the things that I'm sure struck everybody is how large the parallel between what went on as depicted in this film and what is going on here now. And what I missed, and maybe you uh, have some insight that, that I didn't see or comment, was trying to see some resistance or some ideas that had to do with what you do, what we can, where we can go as we watch this going on around us that's so parallel to the horrors that were or shown depicted so chillingly in this film. You want to start, David? <laughs> Sorry. Well, no, you know, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. No, number one, I think, you know, David adverted to Florida and elsewhere where their book bannings and otherwise, and one needs to speak up against that. I think the, you know, Louis Brandeis once said the light is a great disinfectant. So the more we shine a light, we live, I think, in a post-truth world today, and we need to debunk the lies and the untruths that, and conspiracy theories that are abounding around us. And I think, as the lady earlier said, we have to take off blinders as to reading what people say in the context of what's said. Uh, so I, I think there is much that can be done, but it's, uh, it's a difficult challenge. Uh, let, me, let me thank David for doing this. I'm going to ask you one last question, David, if I may, which is I meant to ask you earlier. Do you believe Hitler, who was largely unread and unschooled before this, uh, at least uneducated uh, in traditional sense, read to expand his mind or to more reaffirm his insecurities and prejudices? You know, I, I have to go back and look at my uh, Hitler biographies. Um, Ian Kershaw is, I think, the primary biographer of, of Hitler and see to what extent he talks about Hitler's reading. I've missed it in, in most of the biographies and most of the work I've read on, on Hitler. And it opens up all sorts of questions. Um, was Hitler looking for affirmation? Was Hitler looking for language he could use and language he could quote? Or was Hitler, as the film hints at, being used as a pawn by others who were feeding him this racist, anti-Semitic ideology in their own interests? I don't know. But it's a great question to end with. Um, we should always end with questions, not affirmations. And this is one of the questions that we should take, take home with us. Um, what was the effect of this reading on, on Hitler? Trump 
hasn't read anything since, you know, and, and I don't know, know of any of the Trumpians who have read. Nonetheless, I don't want to go through all the Trumpians who have Ivy League educations from DeSantis to Cruz to Vance to Hawley. One can go on and on and on and on. So maybe they too have picked up, have had their ideologies reinforced by what they're reading. And the only way to counter falsehood um, is with truth. And it is incumbent on, you know, all of us who know better uh, to say so. Well said on that note, David. Thank you, the audience, for coming and the JCC. Thank you.